Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Nick Serio, one of the owners at Athletes Warehouse. I'm gonna be introducing Dr. Brandon Erickson, who is a uh, fellowship trained surgeon. Uh, he did his fellowship at HSS at the same time, was one of the assistant physicians for the New York Mets. Uh, throughout his college career, he played football as a wide receiver at Notre Dame. Um, in addition to that, uh, if, if there can be any addition to all this, uh, he produces an extensive amount of research in the field of baseball and the overhead athlete, while as well, right now, he is an assistant team physician for the Phillies. Uh, next up, we have Rob Andrews. Rob's up here in the top right there. Uh, Rob uh, got his DBT from Toro College. Uh, after that, he went down to Birmingham, Alabama and worked under Kevin Wilk um, and worked at Champion PT. Uh, Rob is also a collegiate baseball player at SUNY Cortland. Next, we have Rob Williams down here, Robbie Williams. Uh, Robbie uh, worked at Ann Arbor, uh, also a DBT, and also worked at Champion Physical Therapy under Kevin Wilt. Um, after that, he left and was a Tigers physical therapist, a Detroit Tigers physical therapist through 2019. He's now back in the um, clinic but uh, gonna bring a wealth of knowledge to this. Uh, next, we have Adam Smith, who's a CSCS with um, working for the uh, Angels at this current moment. Uh, he's been with the Angels since 2016. Before being with the Angels, Adam worked with uh, Eastern Michigan and Syracuse as a internship and one of their uh, strength coaches. Uh, Adam is also a former Cortland grad. Uh, Brett Poneris up in the top left there. Uh, Brett has a CSCS and is one month away from becoming or getting his uh, doctorate in uh, chiropractic. You want to correct me there? No, that was good. I'll, okay. uh, right. I'll, I'll film the graduation ceremony for you. <laughs> Thank you. And, then, uh, and in uh, rounding us out here, uh, we have CJ Riefenhauser, who is a former pro baseball player for uh, the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, now serves as a pitching consultant with us at Athletes Warehouse and then is also a local high school coach. Uh, Nick Serino, a former uh, pitcher with the Nationals, um, also serves as a pitching consultant with us, and they're going to bring a wealth of experience to this conversation. Cool. So first and foremost, what I wanted to start off today with, and I think just to give a little background on what we are going to be discussing today's topic is uh, returning to throwing after a injury, either to the shoulder or elbow. Today, we're really going to hone in on that shoulder joint. Um, Dr. Erickson, if you wouldn't mind, could you come in and just explain sort of the basic like um, musculature mechanisms and then common injuries you see with the shoulder? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> When we talk about the shoulder, we always focus on the glenohumeral joint, right? So the ball and socket of the shoulder. But the shoulder is really made up of four joints. So you have the scapulothoracic joint, the AC joint, the SC joint, and of course the ball and socket glenohumeral joint. And while we're going to talk about a lot of injuries uh, that happen to the ball and socket of the glenohumeral joint, really the biggest issue for our overhead athletes is really the scapulothoracic joint. It's really the foundation for the shoulder. Uh, in the throwing athlete. And if that's not functioning properly, as the guys who've played professionally at a much higher level than I have can tell you, um, it really puts you in a disadvantageous position, really increases your risk of injury. Now, we talk about the shoulder itself. Like I said, it's a ball in a socket. The way the ball stays located in the socket, there's a labrum that goes around it, soft tissue covering your biceps tendon, long, heavier biceps tendon takes its origin from that labrum. Um, so do some of the ligaments that are going to humeral joint. Then, of course, you have the rotator cuff, which is made up of four muscles, as we know, the supraspinatus, so kind of over the top, the subscapularis in the front here, and that helps you to internally rotate your shoulder. The, uh, and I should have said the supraspinatus helps you to abduct your shoulder. The infraspinatus, which is kind of in the back over here, and that helps you externally rotate your shoulder at the side. And the teres minor, which is even further back, and that helps you externally rotate your shoulder here at 90 degrees. If that's not working, your arm kind of falls down, you have something called the forearm corpus line. So those muscles really take their origin from the scapula and in around the shoulder, and they insert onto the ball part of the ball and socket joint or the humerus, and they help us keep the ball centered within the socket, and they help power the shoulder. They, you get about two-thirds of your motion of your shoulder through the glenohumeral joint. The other third comes through the scapula thoracic joint. So you can see they kind of work in concert. 
The other thing in the shoulder and overhead athletes that we talk about a lot is the long head of the biceps tendon. Now you have two parts to the biceps, right? You have a short head, which comes off of your coracoid over here, part of the conjoint tendon, and you have the long head, which takes its origin, like I said, from the labrum, kind of around the 12 o'clock position. And it comes out of your shoulder in the front over here. And when you see guys pointing to their shoulder over here, and they're kind of rubbing over here, usually it's some issue with their bicep tendon or some biceps tendonitis. The reason that becomes relevant in throwers is actually because we're not really sure what the biceps does in throwers. Um, some would argue that it's a humeral head depressor, meaning it keeps the head centered within the socket. Some people say it helps um, decelerate the arm as you're going through your throwing cycle. So as you let go of the ball at that kind of late cock and early acceleration, you go through late acceleration and you get to ball release, you have to decelerate the arm from coming off your body and the biceps tendon may help to decelerate that arm. The problem is you can get a traction injury on the biceps when you have that issue. So in our throwing athletes, we see a couple of things. We see injuries to the rotator cuff, that kind of talked about. Usually it's partial thickness tears, tendonitis type injuries. We can see injuries to the biceps tendon, usually tendonitis. You can get some subtle instability where it slides in an inappropriate, inappropriate position. And you can get something kind of we term impingement in the shoulder. There's two types of impingement in the shoulder. One is kind of in older people who have external impingement, meaning they lift their arm to the side their humeral head rises up, it pinches their rotator cuff between the ball part and your acromion over the top, and you get something called external impingement. That's not super relevant to our throwers. Our throwers usually get something called internal impingement. And that usually comes uh, because the posterior capsule of the shoulder, which is a water balloon covering that goes around the glenohumeral joint, sees a lot of injury in overhead athletes. When you throw, as I mentioned, you have to decelerate the arm. One of the structures that helps decelerate the arm is the posterior capsule in the back of your shoulder. So that water balloon starts to get stretched and starts to get a little hypertrophic because it sees a lot of injury, so it becomes less pliable. When it becomes less pliable, it starts to move the ball and socket joint in a funny way when you start to get into that late cock and early acceleration phase, and it actually can pinch part of the undersurface of the rotator cuff in between the ball and the socket and give you something called internal impingement, and it can contribute to biceps tendonitis. So that's why we focus on a lot of scapular stretching. Those are kind of the main injuries that we see in our overhead athletes. Of course, you can have a, you can die for a ball, dislocate your shoulder, things like that, but that's kind of the main function of the shoulder and, and what we see most commonly in our athletes at varying levels. Awesome. I, I hope everybody grasped that. That was, uh, that was quite a bit right there. And I really appreciate the uh, in-depth response that, you know, for uh, some of our viewers, I'm sure they're like, wait a minute, the rotator cuff is not just some kind of cuff that's in my shoulder. You mean it's four muscles? So um, listen, uh, unbelievable. Uh, I'm going to call on both Rob's here, whichever one really wants to jump in next. And just talk about why don't we attack the labrum first, uh, whichever one of you wants to jump in on the labrum and really how um, you sort of address that labral injury and then how long you really think uh, it takes till we get to a throwing or return to throwing progression there. Yeah, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> first, it's really making sure uh, you're communicating well with the, uh, the physician or the surgeon, understanding where the area of pathology is on the labrum. Is it more anterior, and are we dealing with something that's bank art related, or is this your traditional type labral injury called a slap tear, um, commonly seen in overhead throwers? Um, and really then diving in, is this a s intervention that's going to need surgery? Is this something that we're going to do non-operatively? And more and more research is starting to come out and um, you're, you're starting to see um, a lower instance of surgical intervention immediately. You uh, essentially want to exhaust um, conservative rehab um, before having to go down the, uh, the alley of okay, let's go in and, and let's get a, a surgical repair done with this. Um, so you certainly want to make sure you're doing everything um, dynamically to improve rotator cuff strength stabilization and then also as doc has had mentioned working on scapular thoracic strengthening um making sure there uh there's no areas of dyskinesis with that and making sure that they're working appropriately in unison um and that's where it's going to have to be individualized everyone's going to be a little different in terms of how far you can progress them through their rehabilitation phases um particularly with a labral um pathology um, if this is something that requires surgical intervention, you want to take it slow. Make sure that that labrum's healing appropriately. Um, and the earliest, generally, I would want to start somebody in any type of interval throwing program is probably going to be between four to five months. Now, that's not a type of thing where just because you're it fall in that window that you're automatically, you can begin an interval throwing program. That's where kind of... Um, obtaining appropriate goals along the way 
increasing strength, making sure that they have good strength, not only in the rotator cuff, but also in the scapular stabilizers, um, going through that appropriately. But then you want to implement a uh, kind of a submaximal plyometric program um, using like a, a rebounder, initially starting with two hands, um, doing that for a couple of weeks and then progressing eventually to one hand. Um, as they're able to get through these one-handed type exercises, that gives you um, a lot, a very good idea of, okay, are they ready for a, uh, an interval like throwing program? And then um, from there, it's determining, okay, what kind of timeline are we looking at? What type of player is this? Is this a pitcher, a position player? Um, so really, you're, you're having to work backwards, and that's going to really help um, identify how long you need to, uh, to appropriately um, use an interval throwing program for the person. Awesome. Uh, and I love the, the fact that you indicated how individualized this was going to need to be. Uh, Dr. Erickson, I'm going to pull you back in just for one sec, Rob, and then I'll come up to you. Um, you know, uh, I know that we've uh, really tried to start implementing a lot of non-operative approaches, especially when we're talking about the labrum. Uh, do you want to shed just a little bit of light on why that is? Yeah. It's a good question. And you're absolutely right that as we've started to do more research on these topics and learn a little more about our overhead athletes, we always try to manage them non-operatively. The, the last thing we want to do is go into a, an overhead athlete's shoulder if we don't have to. Um, the, what we've looked at uh, over the years has been some reports, and, and we did a study on this as well, kind of looking using the Major League Baseball database. When we wind up operating on overhead athletes, and this is the professional level, and there's been some other smaller case series at the college and kind of high school level, we know that if we go in and fix a slack tear uh, in a pitcher specifically, they have about a 30 to 40% chance of getting back to their same level. Now, it's a little bit biased, though, because generally we try our best, at least those of us that take care of athletes at a high level, we try our best to, to manage them non-operatively. So there's a little bit of a selection bias with that. So those are people that have failed or should have at least failed all the non-operative management they could. And the last ditch effort to get them back to where they were is to go in and fix their labor. The problem with going in and fixing someone's labrum is that pitchers specifically have these adaptive changes that happen in their shoulder. So they get small tears in their labrum, they get small slap tears, and they get this increase in rotation in their shoulder. It's why they're so good. It's why Chapman can throw a fastball 105 miles an hour. It's because the amount of external rotation he can generate is much more than I can. The reason he can do it is because his capsule stretches out. He has a small tear in his labrum that lets the humeral head move in a way that we're not exactly sure why it does that, but it makes him really efficient. So if we go in, we see this pathology, we see, these, we see this label tear, and we say, all right, we have to fix that tear. But at the same time, we don't want to tighten them up too much because then you can take away their rotation and take away why they're so good. The issue is we don't know what changes in the shoulder are pathologic and what changes are adaptive. And so it's hard when you go in there to really know how much to do. Are you doing too much? Are you doing too little? So I always err on the side of less is more when I go in there if somebody's failed non-operative treatment. But that's kind of the dilemma that we have. Uh, awesome. And, and I appreciate you, you know, admitting that there is such a gray area, too, in that. Um, Rob, Andrews, why don't, we, uh, why don't you come in and give us an idea of what some of those non-operative approaches might look like, especially for, let's say, like a labral tear? Well, uh, the first thing we want to do is, you know, non-operative label tear, any kind of shoulder injury. We want to decrease pain and inflammation in the area of the joint. Um, you know, next, you know, whether it's ice, whatever it is, uh, rest as well. Uh, we want to calm things down a little bit, but then we gradually want to restore motion. Um, you know, we don't want to overstress uh, the range of motion. Um, so, for example, as Dr. Erickson said, um, you know, a lot of these uh, slab tears are going to come from an excessive amount of external rotation and throwing motion. Um, so we want to, you know, we, we don't want to force that external rotation. We don't want to force uh, motion that might, you know, aggravate or irritate that area more. Um, so it's just a gradual increase in range of motion. Um, start to, you know, strengthen up some of the, you know, the, the scapular stabilizers, kind of get that strong base as well. And then gradually start increasing more of the, um, you know, resistance with, you know, band work, um, general throwers 10. Um, just kind of as Rob said, um, you know, gradually increasing everything until you do get to plyometrics um, as well as the throwing program. But, you know, you really can't get into plyometrics or any of that um, until, you know, you're pain-free, full range of motion. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, I guess, I don't want to say guess, test, and revise, but a lot of what you're doing for a non-op, you know, it's not so much protocol-based. It's more so you're kind of listening and seeing the response to you know, that the athlete's having to the treatment. You know, if somebody's aggravated them, you're not going to continue pushing. You're going to kind of, you know, 
peel back a little bit, um, kind of work your way back up. Sorry about that. So as we start to build them back up, right, as you stated, and uh, we're going to get to this end range um, and hopefully bring them back to full range of motion, right, and then obviously have strength through that full range, there are going to be times where we know we just can't do that or the inflammation is just set in so much. Dr. Harrison, can you speak to some other options you may have there if, like, you're headed down your non-op approach and it's just not working uh, or the course is not following through the way you wanted? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point because I think trying to push somebody past a certain point when they, when they just can't get there, you're just going to create a bigger inflammatory response. Um, we do do in some of our athletes uh, a one-time steroid injection for this issue, whether they have internal impingement, to try to calm everything down, um, give them a couple of days to let the steroid injection take effect, and then start to build them back up like the guys were discussing. Um, we don't like to do repeated steroid injections over a long time, but a one-time steroid injection to kind of calm everything down is not necessarily the worst thing. Um, there's some other people that talk about injections like PRP, stem cells, things like that. The research really isn't there yet on a lot of those injections. And so while it's probably not going to hurt, it might help. I can't tell you definitively whether or not it will, but we know that a steroid injection is kind of like dumping a bottle of Advil into your shoulder. And so it can help calm things down uh, pretty nicely in the acute setting. Excellent. Awesome. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a great point, too, that Rob brought up there is that we have to calm stuff down before we get to anywhere, right? We, we can't start beating up this same area if, uh, if you know, all of a sudden we, we still have this inflammation going on. Uh, Coach Brett, if you don't mind, can you, uh, do you think you can jump in here and give some other things that we might be working on, let's say, or, or even looking at when we're about to head into that, um, in that return to throw program. Cause I know from uh, Rob and Robbie's perspective, right? They're gonna be looking very uh, joint focused on that shoulder joint. And I know, you know, Adam can probably shed some light here too, as, as movement coaches primarily, we're really looking at the body from that holistic approach and trying to figure out what can be radiating towards that shoulder or, or creating some of these issues. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we're really talking about is regional interdependence here, right? And the notion that you're not really focused on, on only the one joint where there is injury. I'd say the only time that you are actually focused on the exact tissue, right, is when maybe Dr. Erickson has someone on the surgical table and he's repairing a tear. Uh, other than that, and I think that um, Rob and Robbie would agree too, is even when you're managing rehab, you're always thinking about how did the person get to that point where they had this injury, right? So you're looking at different things. And one thing that we can look at is the cervical spine. Um, it's a very complex area. And I think it's an area that's now starting to really be researched and, um, and show that when you address things more proximally or closer to center, to center, right, it can have a profound effect on things that happen distally. And the cervical spine is such a complex area, right? You have the the neurovascular bundle or nerves and, and arteries and veins, right, that originate in the neck or thorax and that are passing through the thoracic cavity, uh, things along those lines. And a good example would be rotation, right? So if the name of the game of throwing hard, being successful is, is separation in the athlete, right, um, we see some of our best pitchers can almost turn their back to home plate in, in the windup while still remaining focused on, on their target. Um, that takes an incredible amount of cervical rotation. Uh, and a lot of people don't think of it that way because their eyes are remaining fixed or you're staying fixed on the target, but it's relative rotation about the cervical spine. So if you don't have the requisite motion in the cervical spine, for instance, you're probably going to compromise um, separation. And you, know, you might compensate somewhere, whether it comes in the form of just a decrease in velocity or it comes in the form of compensating through another area of muscle or whatever. Uh, other things like breathing dysfunction, right? If they're breathing and elevating through their thorax every single time they throw a ball or even worse, every single time they take a deep breath, you know, you're elevating things like the first rib into the, into the neurovascular bundle. Um, you're tightening the scalene muscles, which, which can impinge upon that neurovascular bundle as well. And, and the final thing is just there's so much referred pain, right? So if, you, if I have pain right in the anterior posterior, I can point to it. But my pain is right there. It doesn't necessarily mean that the structure that's bothersome or the, the mechanical fault is underneath your finger, right? We know enough about, about trigger point referral and, and um, facet joint referral and such that, that you really have to investigate the motions throughout the entire component of the throwing motion in order to maybe get to a more functional diagnosis than we would otherwise. 
Excellent. Awesome uh, explanation there. Adam, I'm going to call on you real quick because oftentimes, and you know, it happens in, in our location and then hopefully it happens in a lot of others. And we, we do have great communication with the physical therapists that we work with. And then obviously this panel, I'm calling on these guys all the time, but you know, there's oftentimes when somebody is still strength training, even though they're going through physical therapy and coming back, um, what are some of the things you're watching for in some of your athletes, even though you know they may be coming back from uh, a labrum type injury? For sure. Yeah. I mean, communication is huge. And, you know, I'm fortunate that, you know, we're essentially working in the same building with with our PT, our medical, um, obviously the doctor's not there full time, but you know, they're, they're obviously communicating with the PTs the entire time. Um, so for us, I mean, it, it's important to take a step back. It's really a good opportunity, you know, kind of look at it in a, a different direction, but when someone does have an injury, right, uh, Rob kind of mentioned four to five months is kind of a, just a, a general timeline with some of these things. And it's a really good opportunity for us to be able to take a step back and really hammer home some dysfunctions that, that we've kind of, you know, picked up in the guys, whether it's scapular thoracic or, you know, breathing patterns or, or pelvic stability or pelvic control and that kind of stuff. It really gives us, it gives us an amount of time to, we know that they don't have to perform within the next week or within the next two weeks out on the field. So it really gives us a, a chance to step back and, and take, take care of some of these dysfunctions that really do take a while to, um, to create the full adaptation that we're looking for. And, and sometimes when they're, when they're constantly playing, you know, it's, it's really tough for them because they develop a lot of these adaptations because they're playing. And then when you're trying to fix them while they're playing, it, 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 it helps, but you know, you're, you're a little bit limited in, in how much progress you're able to make. So then when you, when you have a few months to be able to work on it, it's, it's a really good, really good opportunity to be able to take that step back and, and hammer that stuff home with the athlete and help them get in a better position so that when they do come back, they're ready to go. And then from a, from a strength side of it, um, I mean, we're, we're still training, you know, again, we're talking with the PT, you know, and, and what we think, you know, as, as a collective group is, is good exercises and whatnot for them to do, but we're, you know, we're still trying to, um, we're still trying to maintain core strength. We're still trying to maintain lower body strength. We're still trying to, you know, maintain power in the lower half, elasticity, you know, we're not trying to lose any of those qualities, especially, you know, cardiovascular wise, it's, it's pretty easy to get deconditioned in, in four to six, four to six months um, if you're not focused on, on that kind of stuff. So you're really trying to keep those those physiological qualities still there um, while they're coming back from it. And then obviously once they're able to start um, integrating that that limb or, or, you know, this goes for any limb, but that, that shoulder back into the exercises Again, we're, we're making sure now that they have that range, that function, that they're moving properly. Now we got to strengthen through those ranges, right? Because if we just have the range and we don't have that, that end range strength in there, then, you know, now they're susceptible and they're not able to handle those loads um, at those ranges. So then we go into that and then, you know, we start, you know, measuring strength and, and, and some power in, in, in those ranges. And again, that, that's with the PT. I mean, we want to see that they're able to get back to, to some strength measures and, some symmetry side to side in terms of, of the forces and, and the power that they're able to produce. Awesome. You, you brought up such a good point there that um, some of these adaptations, I know Dr. Erickson had, had mentioned this earlier, um, you know, some of these adaptations are actually uh, occurring because of the fact that they're playing the sport and they're even more heightened while they're in sport during that time. And especially the injury is likely happening in sport, right? So a lot of those adaptations are going to be present. Coach Brett, you and I have talked about this at numerous occasions. It's like, is our initial eval a waste of time anyway? Because, yeah, it gives us our baseline, but it, it's not really telling us the story that's going on while they're playing, right? And, you know, even if we wanted to look at, like, back hip internal rotation and that, that, how that would affect then the shoulder in that regard from the lat attachment, it, their internal rotation could increase, uh, the deficit of it could increase over the season, and end up leading a, a totally different story for us. But um, I thought that was an incredible uh, way to articulate how difficult it is to really manage that during that time. Um, I wanted to call on CJ now because I wanted him to sort of give uh, – CJ, we've had a, a number of shoulder injuries over our career, right? And uh, I, wanna, I wanted him to sort of give sort of his interpretation of what happened with him, and then, you know, I'll let him run with it. Yeah, no, I, um, just in my experience, when 
Uh, obviously, you're playing a lot. You're doing a lot of arm care. You're doing a lot of stuff to maintain and keep yourself healthy. Uh, for me, I was, you know, doing weighted balls. And I don't think I'm biased against it. I just don't know as much as, you know, back then when I was doing it. I didn't know as much going into it, and I just ran with it. I think I went into it too blind. Um, and I definitely hurt my shoulder. And I think what you guys are saying, too, is when we do see an athlete that – comes in with a shoulder an injury, we, our evaluation is different. Like we want to see his pitching mechanics. We want to see, did he hurt it on the field or did he hurt it, you know, diving for a player doing something else. And I think for us, um, it's definitely more, what can we fix mechanically? What can we do to, I guess, keep that athlete on the mound as long as possible without, you know, pain or injury or sustaining, you know, too much force on that shoulder that, you know, we can. So when uh, you have a, you had a torn labrum, correct? Uh, rotator cuff and partially torn labrum. Okay. So, and what did you have? Uh, you have anchors put in, correct? What were, do you know what your anchors were put into or not? I, I have two anchors in where? I don't know. Okay. Um, so the recovery from that, shed a little light on how challenging that was from you both physically and mentally? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a long process. Uh, mentally, I think it's way harder than it is physically because you're going to have good days and bad days, and you know going into that, that's what you're going to expect. Um, for me, it was tough, as you guys just said, four or five months, right? And that's it's a long time, um, especially when, you know, you grew up playing every single day, doing anything you can to get better. Now you kind of have to take that step back. and trying to focus on more of the little things now, how to get back into playing, how to, you know, band work, range of motion, all that stuff. How do I, how does that, how long that takes and how much that drains on your mind? I mean, Dr. Epson said, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, stuff out there about stem cell, but that's what I did. I, after my surgery, I did get stem cell um, just because I had to speed it up. Uh, my timetable, the clock, everything was ticking. And it's just a, such a short window of time that, in my, you know, obviously in my situation, you know, you have to try to do whatever you can in that short amount of time. And, you know, rehabbing, coming back, everything, you know, came back fine. But once you go through surgery, you know, the, the hardest thing you guys just said, it's you get 30, 40% of the people come back 100%. Um, for me, I was close. I wasn't there and I needed, I needed to come back 100%. So, yeah, that was my situation, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it seems obviously a much more difficult situation when, especially when you're dealing with it at somebody who's at the professional level there, right? Because those final percentages of what you need to get better all matter, right? When we're at the high school level, getting somebody back to their 100%, that 100% may be so gray and what does that actually mean? Um, that it's, you know, it's, it's a much easier task to get somebody back to where they feel like, hey, I can compete again. Whereas when we're vying for, I mean, Siege, we were probably vying for 2% at that point, right? And uh, trying to get you back into that. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible perspective then to see, um, you know, what you had to deal with. And I think really what a lot of people can take away from what you just went through there is the mental aspect of it. Because that time period when you are not playing uh, that's taking an athlete's identity away from them. And that is a very, very challenging thing. And when you have, um, like, you know, Adam mentioned there, when you have communication amongst all professionals that are involved in your treatment, it makes it that much more confident for you that you can get back to that point. Um, that's why, again, we're incredibly lucky to have the panel we have in front of us because clearly everybody right here is on the same path that you know, we really, really want to be communicating um, for each one. Uh, so let's, let's fast forward here and let's assume uh, we've had surgery, uh, we've gotten them through the four to five month period of time. Uh, Dr. Erickson, why don't you shed some light on, and Nick, I'm coming to you in a sec when it comes to when we get to these throwing programs. Why don't you shed some light on uh, exactly what throwing programs you prescribe and then uh, what is out there? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, 
it's a good question that brings up some of the deficiencies that we quite frankly have in our throwing programs. Um, there's no one program that everyone says, this is what you have to do. This is exactly right. Same thing for a hitting program. We talk a lot about throwing, but you got to think about hitting too, right? Talk about a label tear and a batter, batter shoulder, right? Poster, label tear. When do we let them go back to swing and a bat? Um, we just put out a study looking at, you know, when do you let guys go back to hit after a Tommy John, right? Because, you know, we focus on pitchers in uh, Major League Baseball, but most pitchers that get Tommy John are high school and college, and they're still hitting. Um, you know, as far as a throwing program that we use, depending on what surgery the person had done, right? So if somebody had something just like a debridement where you went in and just kind of cleaned up some tissue, didn't repair anything, you can be a little more aggressive on when you start your throwing program, as opposed to if you have somebody who had a labor repair or rotator cuff repair or something like that, we're waiting for some tissue to heal and we have to kind of back them off a little bit. So it's usually a few months before they come pick up a baseball for anything. Sometimes it's four, five, six months, like we just talked about. Now, the throwing program that I usually use and that we've kind of talked about in the past, you know, usually we start with a short toss, right? So just playing catch 60 feet. You start to walk it back out a little further, 90 feet, 120 feet. You start usually going at a lofted long toss. Um, now, how far to get out in the long toss, we can definitely talk about. I'd love to hear everybody's opinion on that. Once you get out to kind of lofted long toss, then we bring you back in a little bit. We start doing uh, long toss on the rope, and then we start to walk you out a little bit further. Once you can do long toss on a rope pretty pretty much pain-free, um, we'll progress you on to flat ground work. Now, the thing you have to remember is everybody's going to progress through this a little bit differently. And so a lot of times guys will come in and say, listen, I was, you know, I was out to 120 feet and I was doing great. And then, you know, I had a little twinge of pain in my shoulder. And, and what do I do now? Well, you just take a couple of days, you step back, and then you take a step back from where you were, and then you continue along. It's not uncommon in the throwing rehab process to have setbacks at least two or three times where the shoulder or the elbow is going to flare up. It's actually very common for that to happen. And so everybody wants to progress through it perfectly, but the reality is that's not going to happen uh, just because you're trying to get yourself back to a very elite level. And so it takes some time and some hard work and a little bit of pain to get there. Uh, a lot of pain, not a good thing, but a little bit of pain inflammation, not a problem. So once, you, once you've completed your long toss on a rope, like I said, we start some flat ground work. Once the flat ground works going well, then we progress you on to a mount. Now, I'd be interested to hear what Rob and Robbie have to say about flat ground work because we know that some of the work out of Alabama said that there may be some increased stress in the shoulder and elbow when you're throwing from flat ground versus throwing from the mound. Um, so I don't harp on flat ground that much with the guys. Some guys really like it and they feel comfortable doing it, but I don't um, harp on that as much as I do long toss kind of on a rope and then progressing on to uh, mound work. And when you get to a mound, obviously, then you're throwing from a mound to a catcher, obviously, we start with just um, uh, a batter standing in there without swinging, then we progress on to live BP, and then to a simulated game, and then on to a real game. So it's a, it's a very long process, and how long it takes is really based on um, – is really based on the player, what they had done, and how well they're progressing throughout it. And, you know, to what you do well at, Nick, aside from all the other stuff you do, but the mental aspect of it, you have to make sure that you tell the guys, and I tell them all up front after they have surgery done, you're going to have some setbacks, so you need to be prepared for that. And it's okay that you do. It's just that we have to continue you along the process, um, and you'll do well in the end, which, which most guys do, but, it, but it's a process. Yeah, it, it definitely is a process, and uh, I can certainly attest to the fact that we have experienced, uh, you know, the the fear in a lot of kids, right? They have this uh, kinesophobia, right? This fear of moving the arm in that direction and how fast they need to move it, and so on and so forth. And and what ends up happening is they feel a twinge and they think, oh my God, I'm back at square one. And it's a lot of, you know, and, and for I, I, I'm not a PT, obviously, but as a PT and I'm sure as even a pitching coach having, if you haven't dealt with labrum recoveries or if you haven't dealt with those, they're frightening to even you as the coach during that time. Cause you're like, Oh my God, I can't feel the pain that this kid is feeling right now. So it's a, it's a scary moment, but as you start to deal with quite a few of them, you start to realize, okay, little bit of sensations here and there, like you mentioned are, are not the, the end of the world. Um, I'm going to call on Robbie Williams here. I, I know that you want to talk about the difference between the flat ground and mound uh, throwing. Yeah. <clears throat> As he'd mentioned, long toss programs are definitely going to have to be individualized, um, whether it's position player or pitcher, the pitcher's age, things like that. Um, definitely a, a lot of the, the work uh, we can credit with Dr. Fleisig down in Birmingham. Um, we do know once throwers reach a distance of about 120 feet, um, 
the uh, kinetics and kinematics are very similar to throwing off of a mound once they reach that distance. And then once they go past 120, um, they say it can be a little more um, with different uh, um, throwing kinematics as they go to a longer distance. So kind of a rule of thumb. Um, I've always found once you're able to get to about 120 feet and you're throwing asymptomatic, um, that goes to show that they're ready to start doing um, some mound-like throwing. Now, Dr. Ella Trash out in LA, um, they've done some research um, comparing flat ground to mound throwing, and they actually found that the forces were greater um, throwing uh, flat ground versus throwing off of a mound. And so um, that gave Reddance to, hey, maybe we can have players doing some light mound throwing drills versus just doing flat ground throwing because uh, it's going to be uh, lower stress on uh, both the shoulder and elbow um, for that matter. Awesome. Yeah, uh, that's quite impressive too because I know several years ago the thought was that the mound was significantly more uh, tension and force on the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. So uh, it, it's amazing some of that new research coming out. Um, Rob, Andrews, why don't you jump in here and let's talk about a little bit more of how you would clear somebody to then go to that actual throwing. Yeah, um, so I mean, a couple of things we know we need to have, obviously full range of motion. Um, you know, we need, you know, good shoulder strength, rotator cuff strength, um, you know, no pain, things like that. But, you know, one thing that we don't really have with the overhead athletes that say we do have with you know an ACL is these functional tests um so Dr. Erickson I'm curious about what you guys typically do for that because you know we don't really we, have, we don't really have anything um down in Birmingham we were doing a little bit of you know uh, we we're doing like a, a series of four exercises we were doing uh prone ball drops we were doing a 90-90 wall throw um just counting the amount of reps they were able to do in about 30 seconds um comparing it to their non-dominant throw their non-throwing arm uh, we're also looking at how long they're able to hold the plank for before breaking or, or losing, you know, losing control, basically. Um, and we were also doing a step down test um, just to, you know, get a little bit of lower extremity strengthening in there as well, or, you know, testing lower extremity in the hips. Um, so I think a lot of times we, you know, these kids get cleared to start throwing, you know, especially the, you know, the, the adolescents, the 12 year olds after surgery. Um, and, you know, probably, you know, the reason they got hurt in the first place is they're super weak, their core is super weak, their hips are super weak. So they're not even able to generate, you know, force from the ground up and transfer that energy up through their arm. So their arm's taking all that stress through. Um, so is there, are there any tests that you particularly like, you, like using, any different functional tests um, that you guys look at before, you know, clearing these kids to start throwing? Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question. Um, you're right. We don't have the same battery of functional tests. We don't have a functional movement screen or uh, that we do for the ACL, right? Is your quad at, at least 80% of your other side, what's your six or eight and step down? Like it doesn't exist in the shoulder. Um, I think some of us are working on quantifying that, but, but there's nothing out there on that. For me personally, I agree with what you said, mostly about the kinetic chain. I think that's most important. So if you're not rotating well through your hips, if your core is weak, I think you're very much at an increased risk of injury because if you have to generate all the force you're going to do to throw a baseball from your shoulder and elbow, of course you're going to get hurt if you're not generating from your legs and you can't transfer it up to your thoracic spine. So for me, I love seeing good hip to shoulder separation. So if they're, um, if they're really or not, if they don't have a good hip to shoulder separation by that, what I mean is when their front foot hits the ground and their pelvis is pointing towards home plate, where are their shoulders pointing? Are they pointing towards third base if they're a right-handed thrower, or are they pointing towards the third baseline somewhere in there? We did a study looking at um, pitching fatigue and trying to find some kinematic variables that change as pitchers got fatigued, you know, elbow flexion angle, ball release, max knee flexion height, things like that. We didn't find much um, in regards to those variables. What we did find was that hip to shoulder separation started to go down the tubes as pitchers got fatigued. So in their first inning versus their sixth inning. So I think core strength, like you said, with measuring a plank is really important. The, the issue that I found and that we haven't really been able to um, overcome yet is how do you really quantify core strength? So I think a plank is a good idea, um, but it's hard from guy to guy, and it's hard to know if that translates to throwing, right? So should we use a dead book? Should we use a side plank? I don't know the answer, and it's a great question, and I would love to hear anybody's thought on that and what they think the best way to measure core strength is. 
because it's very difficult. The other things we start to talk about now are things like spin rate and velocity and things like that to know when they're ready to really go back. Um, the issue is you have to have kind of pre-injury data on that before you can really compare to it. So now that we're starting to screen guys more for things, especially at the higher levels, but really, like you said, to the adolescents and the younger guys who don't necessarily have that data, it becomes a little more difficult. Because in the lower extremities, you want to have equal side to side, you know, strength, things like that, motion. In the shoulder, it's completely different. You have to have very different motion in your throwing shoulder than you do in your non-throwing shoulder. Again, based out of the work from, you know, Wilkin, Fleissig, and Dugas and the guys in Alabama, if you don't have at least five degrees more of external rotation on your throwing shoulder, you're at an increased risk of shoulder and elbow injury. So it's hard to go in a dominant to non-dominant shoulder um, as opposed to the leg where they should be more, or the knee where they should be more or less the same. Um, that was a roundabout answer to your question, basically saying we don't have a good battery of tests yet. Uh, I, I will uh, absolutely agree, though, with both of you in the sense that um, we, we do need to look at the holistic approach there in the entire kinetic chain because we can't assume that this joint that is basically held together by muscle right, is, not going, is, is going to respond only based on how that joint is functioning. Um, so I love the fact that you guys were looking at, um, you know, lower extremity there in terms of clearing somebody back to it. Uh, very difficult to tell a 12 year old parent uh, or a parent of a 12 year old, obviously, um, you know, that, uh, listen, your son's just flat out weak in the lower half because, and this is likely some of the reasons they got hurt in the first place. Difficult conversation to have, but I'm sure we've all been there. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit now, right? And I want to fast forward some more. And I want to get to the point where um, we're now throwing. Uh, Coach Nick, I'm going to call on you. Uh, and I just want to hear from you, like, some of the, uh, you know, areas you're looking at in terms of kinematics and, like, you know, what they're looking like when they're throwing and so on and so forth. Yeah, so basically the first thing that I look for is, you know, the arm slot, making sure that the arm slot is – you know, staying consistent. When I was with the um, Nationals, Ching Meng Wong was down there and coming off of the shoulder surgery, you know, and they would have him at shortstop hitting him ground balls and just the field and, you know, just figure out where his arm slot was without thinking. You know, so I think that's, you know, probably the biggest thing, you know, and obviously working from the upper body down to the lower body with the uh, fr front arm, you know, making sure his front arm is staying still. It's not flying open. That's going to put stress on anything. You know, and then with his head direction at the same time, making sure his head staying in line and just staying straight. But, you know, until he can figure out his, his arm slot, you can't really do much with it because now it's, you know, you'll be changing pitch to pitch. You know, with the lower body, it's, you know, what I look for is making sure a guy can land in the same spot every single time. If you can do that, his body's probably going to be in, you know, some sort of, this, you know, same position, which is going to be able to repeat it, you know, and, like Dr. Erickson said, you know, the hip to, hip to shoulder separation is big, but if, you know, we're not landing in the same spot, we're never going to get to that same spot. So, you know, I think, you know, the biggest, biggest two things that I look at is, you know, arm slot and if they land in the same spot. So. You know, what's, uh, what's so amazing there, Nick, is uh, you brought up arm slot, right? And, and I mean, I'll, I'll do it to the whole panel here. Where is arm slot come in in any single return to throw program? Where's any arm slot work? Zero, right? And, and I get it. The issue is that we would then have to teach arm slot mechanics and everything like that to everybody and expect them to be an expert on that, which would be next to impossible. But there are certainly things out there uh, that do work on this. And I would love to like hit on some of these. CJ, I know we started using quite a bit of these with some of our uh, guys that we had to bring back and you know Dr. Erickson we've talked at, about this at length in terms of just different ways that we can start working on that arm path because I, I, I got to imagine that everybody would agree with this when you're taking a kid who hasn't thrown a baseball in four to five months and expecting him to not have any kinesophobia with throwing a baseball that's like literally the craziest thing in the world so the last thing we want to see is a kid going out there and doing one of these jobs from 15 to 45 feet away because the program calls for 45 feet. So he's gonna throw 20 throws like a dart from 45 feet away and go home and say, yeah, you know what? I got my throwing in for today and feel like he did something, you know, 
uh, productive there. Coach Nick, you want to jump back in? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think even so, you know, not even coming off of surgery, but, you know, coming off a season and then, you know, your rest that you have, just trying to, you know, when you're back to throwing, even when you're healthy, you know, just trying to figure out your arm slot is, you know, I know from my, my standpoint, it was the hardest thing to figure out. You know, my arm slot would change year to year just because of what felt right at that time. You know, so I think that's a, you know, healthy or non-healthy, I think it's a big thing. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and really, we could all sit here and say, right, at the end of the day, what, you know, uh, Dr. Erickson, you mentioned it in the very beginning, right? You mentioned that it's ball and socket. And that's what the most important thing, right? So if that humeral head is not proprioceptively sitting in that socket the right way, we're going to have pain, or we're going to have at least dysfunction at that point in time. So it really doesn't matter. You're absolutely right, Nick whether it's coming off of injury or whether it's literally just coming back from a long period of rest, right? The, the condition of knowing where my arm is at is, is primary interest number one. CJ, uh, you wanted to jump in here. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to touch base on something that we did with our pitchers this year when how we started everybody, even if they were coming back from surgery or they weren't, um, and we just put a five-ounce ball in their hand. Uh, made them close their eyes, get on their knees, and kind of go through their motion. And then that's where we can make cues because, like Nick just said too, posture, keeping your head still, making sure you're closed, um, basically seeing where your elbow is in line to your shoulder. And then, you know, because you are getting, you know, some thoracic mobility that way when you do your turns, um, definitely helps us see a lot more than just, hey, go play catch real fast. And then, even back to a kid that had surgery, like you were saying, the outcome is not necessarily our biggest goal right away. It's more of that, hey, the kid throws effortless. The kid feels good. Um, even not throwing to a person, maybe throwing to a wall, and just letting him feel that after, after his holds, just to see, hey, look, how does that feel? What are we feeling? Because kids that had surgery now – I. They're definitely scared to re-hurt that injury, no doubt. But at the end of the day, they know pain versus soreness because they know that, hey, look, this really didn't feel right and I couldn't even lift my arm after I threw versus, you know, it took me about a day or two to get back into it, but I'm all right. And I think kind of just, you know, walking that road with them and just kind of making sure that they're okay and making sure arm path and posture and all that stuff is in line. And I think that's kind of the, the easy way to go about it. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, we uh, this year when we had some return to throw guys, we actually, uh, as CJ was mentioning there, um, we had them initially start with uh, what we call hold throws, where they're just going through the action and not actually releasing the object. So you're you're eliminating the fear of doing that. Uh, then progressing to an eyes closed scenario and doing that with that, so that they can get some of that proprioceptive work in the shoulder. Um, but probably my favorite part of that entire discussion that CJ just went through was throwing without a target. And I know that's obtuse to what we hear now in baseball world, especially in the pitching world, which is like every throw must have intent behind it and must, must have intent to hitting a specific spot. When you have a kid coming out of a, uh, a surgery type position or not having thrown in a long time, what do you think they're going to be gauging how well they do, right? It's going to be, can I hit the target I'm trying to hit? And if their proprioception is all over the place in terms of their shoulder, that's going to be very difficult to continuously hit that same target. So having them throw at just a larger wall or a net or something that doesn't allow them to gauge or give that metric uh, definitely served very well for a lot of our guys early on in the development. Um, Coach Brett, I'm going to call on you real quick, and I know you had some other stuff you wanted to drop in there in terms of that return to throw. Yeah, I, I think something that we're all hitting at and what, what patients and athletes and really anybody we're working with should know is that we're basing what we're doing in terms of an intervention off of the most current research that we have, right? I mean, that's how any clinician or any strength coach should be operating. And I think that it, it speaks a lot where you could go to 10 different baseball performance coaches, 10 different PTs, Cairo surgeon, or well, maybe not with surgery, but um, in terms of rehab, and you might get 
10 different programs. They might all be focused around the same thing, right? But you get 10 different programs. And what I think that does speak to is the ambiguity of the research that we have. And the reason is, is that these things are incredibly hard to study, as we pointed out. How do you quantify strength? How do you quantify stability? I mean, so, so what we have to do is just take what we have in the literature, apply our best knowledge in terms of what we've seen, and and hope that we're essentially doing no harm first, but that we take the principles that we realize and then and then move forward. And I think um, a program like the one that's been implemented at AW with the the no eyes throwing, you know, that's how research eventually gets published, right? So you look at the results that we have of how hard were they throwing the season before, how hard are they throwing now, are they pain free, and then maybe you can you know perform some sort of study, but. I think a lot of people want concrete results when it comes to these things, but I mean, everyone's really touched on it. These things are so incredibly hard to study. And so we can't be sticklers and criticize every single thing that comes out. We just have to take what we have available in the literature, push forward and sort of implement our best ways that we've seen or, you know, discussions like this and, and sort of push through and try and uh, make headway some, somehow. Yeah, and, and listen, and I think you, you bring up a great point in the sense that we're trying to use best practices, right? And then we're trying to uh, educationally guess, that wasn't even a word, but guess ahead of time, right? In terms of, you know, what could work and what might not work. And ultimately, at the end of the day, choosing things that will do no harm at the same time, right? And, and trying to progress these programs moving forward. Um, I'll call on to anybody here real quick. If, have you seen any major shifts go on or, or changes in the way that you have done return to throwing or anything in that regard? I, I would say not necessarily change, but I would say as we learn more about how things heal and what we need to get better, that we probably slowed it down a little bit rather than pushing guys to get back faster. So uh, from my perspective, you know, timing's always an issue. All of us have to deal with it. Um, getting guys back, trying to not miss two seasons. If you have to miss a season, just miss one. Um, but sometimes taking an extra couple of weeks um, if they need to, to get to where they need to be before they go back and not rushing it um, can be pretty beneficial. So guys, let's, let's close this off today with um, just each person giving sort of their um, – advice in terms of how somebody should really handle if they feel like they have an injury um let's say they do have an injury and how they should really then go about addressing uh the next steps uh dr erickson i'll start with you yeah i think um you know as kind of the panels talked about you know there's a difference between you know having a little pain and soreness after you throw and and feeling something that doesn't feel right um, if you have something in your shoulder and elbow that, you know, you've been throwing for a while and this feels very different and your velocity's down, your accuracy's down, you're not sure what's going on, have somebody look at that, whether it's a physical therapist, whether it's an orthopedic surgeon, um, have somebody take a look at you just to make sure that you're not going to do anything worse uh, to the shoulder if you keep throwing. A lot of times we'll be able to address some deficits, uh, whether it's with some of your rotation, some of your motion, some of your strength, et cetera, that's predisposing you to having that. So we can help you fix that before you have a bigger problem with the shoulder. Um, if you know you do have an injury that we can't get better after a good amount of rehab, and I would tell you, don't. Um, and everybody kind of has everybody has varying opinions on rehab. I'm a big fan of rehab. I think therapists, trainers, et cetera, do a really good job. Um, you have to really buy into it when you go to it, though. You can't just say, "I went to rehab uh, for two weeks and I'm not better and just fix my shoulder." Well, listen. I enjoy, I, I love operating. It's why I do what I do, but I more enjoy having my players at a hundred percent back in the field. So you really need to give therapy um, and, and, you know, correcting some of your deficits a real shot before you uh, kind of call it quits on that. And, and I'm very specific on that. I know you are, Nick, um, about making sure guys have addressed their deficits before we say, okay, we've done everything we can. We haven't gotten you back, and now it's time to, okay, now we can go fix it. If we get to that point, that's okay. Um, and in the thrower's shoulder, I have a very real conversation with guys, depending on what the pathology is, if we can get them back. Uh, but if they've done the right things and we do the surgery the right way, a lot of times we can get them back. But as, as you, you talked about before, it's a little easier for a high school guy to get back because high school pitchers have to get out high school hitters. 
professional players, have, professional pitchers have to get out professional hitters. And so it's much harder to get back in the pros than it is in high school and college. Um, and there's also kind of a natural attrition that happens. So if you think about it, there are some guys that just drop off level to level, whether or not it's injury related or you're just, quite frankly, not good enough to progress to the next level, which I was not good enough to progress to the to the NFL from, from college. Quite frankly, I barely made the cut in college. So I wasn't going to make it to the next level. And there's an attrition that happens from that. So that has to be understood as well. Excellent. Awesome. Uh, I think every coach here was shaking their head when you talked about the buy-in because uh, if you could get that from an athlete, that's, uh, that's, that's the first step really in towards getting them to actually being healed. Uh, Dr. Robbie Williams, why don't you jump in and give your insight here? Yeah, probably the, the first thing I always address is you have to be patient and getting them to buy in that, you know, this is going to take some time. Um, and generally, if it's an operative procedure or non-operative, more often in a baseball player, their first question is, when can I start throwing again? Um, and that's where you need to establish kind of um, benchmarks along the way. And Dr. Erickson mentioned a very good point. It's never a linear process. There's going to be plateaus along the way. There might be even an occasional setback or two. Um, but reassure, reassuring and improving their confidence level, like, hey, um, let's, let's get you stronger first. We, and whether you do manual muscle testing or use a hand diamondometer, um, and you can show that actual objective improvement in their strength, that they build from that. And then as they appropriately reach that next benchmark level, like, hey, strength is in an excellent position. Let's see, let's get you doing plyometrics now, um, improving their confidence. Um, I, you mentioned kinesiophobia. That's been a word that's been mentioned several times in this co uh, conversation. You want to improve their confidence um, because as they improve their confidence, they're going to see objective improvements. Um, and so getting them comfortable doing two handed plyometrics, they're comfortable with that knowing, okay, now let's do one-handed plyometrics. Um, and they're doing that, uh, throwing a baseball should be nothing by the time they're, uh, they're done with a one-arm plyometric program because that's going to give improve their confidence because the last thing you don't want to do is day one of an interval throwing program, give them that baseball and say, all right, let's see how it goes. You want them knowing before they even touch that baseball that they're going to do outstanding. Uh. A hundred percent. I I wish I could have that said ten thousand times over. Um, Coach Adam, I'm gonna have you uh, come in next. Why don't you give your uh, advice here? Yeah. So I mean, for me, it's like when when stuff initially starts happening and a little discomfort, but a little bit further than what was normal for for people, especially kids. I think it's important, you know, to to say something and reach out. There are a lot of a lot of kids who are hesitant and nervous to say something to their coach or to someone that's essentially in a position of authority that, you know, they don't feel right and stuff like that. So it's, it's really important to, you know, reach out to your coach. Hopefully that they're in an environment around professionals similar to us at AW, you know, a phenomenal environment um, where you can reach out to the network there and communicate with them as early as possible. Cause you know, pushing through, pushing through that pain longer and longer um, is obviously just going to make get harder and harder to come back for and, and make it more likely that they'll have to end up, you know, getting surgery if we weren't able to take the right rehabilitative steps um, right from the get going. That's why I think it's important for um, someone who's, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about like a college or professional. I'm talking about, you know, high school or, or youth kid here. It's important for them to get in an environment like an AW because then you guys have, you guys have assessments on them. You guys have, strength numbers on them. you guys have like benchmarks of where they were at so then you can kind of assess it see where they're at if they've been away from the facility for a little bit during the season um just because of time or, or they haven't been there they can they can come back in and you guys can assess them see oh man like this is this is way different than where you're at and then also as you're getting back into you know throwing and coming back you guys have strength numbers on them. you guys have benchmarks of where they were at previously that they can hit those benchmarks on their way back to rehab whereas if, if they if they haven't ever been around a program or exposed to people who are keeping track of of how they're progressing with with strength range of motion and movement patterns it, it's it's going to be harder for them to progress back because there's no baselines to go off of off of it for them uh excellent awesome points there uh n especially the fact that you know I, and i completely agree with you a lot of younger kids are very afraid uh to reach out and, th and that may be because they don't feel like they have the outlet to reach out 
Um, I think the high school level is probably the most culprit of that because of the fact that their playing time can get squished very fast um, if they're in an injured state. Um, great points, Adam. I thank you very much for that. Um, Dr. Andrews, I'm going to call on you next. Um, well, I think everyone kind of kind of nailed everything already, but uh, you know, I, I think you, you kind of have like two kinds of people, two kinds of athletes. You got the, you know, you got the workhorses who just never really complain about anything. They have pain. They just kind of keep going after it. And then you got the kids who, you know, just kind of worried about every little feeling they have. Uh, you know, they have the, you know, parents are kind of overbearing, freaking out about everything. So I think it's important for them to know that, you know, a little bit of soreness, you know, soreness after throwing, dull aching, it, you know, generally it's normal um, and don't necessarily have to, you know, be overly concerned about it, more so just keep an eye on it. Um, if it persists and it's every, it's a daily thing, then maybe it's something, you know, you, you do go to, you know, a therapist, a doctor about, um, you know, especially during the throwing program, if you are in that throwing program, getting back to, you know, getting back into it after an injury, you know, the soreness is, it's going to happen. Um, you know, you start getting a little bit more nervous when it's more of a, you know, sharp, you know, severe pain. Um, you know, and then it's very important, you know, to reach out and, and get something looked at, at least just to kind of, you know, rule it out more so than anything. But like I said, I think everyone kind of, kind of hit that one on the head. Well, I, I, listen, I think that was a phenomenal point too, right? Because, uh, you know, we always state, listen, uh, you're going to be an athlete, right? You're foregoing your opportunity for being comfortable. Um, and I think people have a very misconstrued perspective sometimes of the difference between being comfortable and then being in pain. And they blend a lot of those uh, often. And, and especially in the, in the realm of baseball. I mean, let's be honest, right? We're, we're very finicky about our shoulder and our elbow. And I, I know we're having a talk on that topic and a lot of people you know who are at a very young age they're not making a living off of that that limb yet uh and it, there's nothing to say that they will be so I, I completely agree with you that there there is there does have to be this waking up of understanding the difference between the two uh coach brett i'm gonna call on you next sure um so i think there have obviously been a lot of great points made so i mean some of the points that i had were obviously get evaluated um, by someone you trust get multiple opinions if that's what you want to do um trust the process and then i think where i'll add, add a little something extra is and we've talked about this before as an athlete becomes injured all of a sudden their their identity becomes in crisis to them right uh their self-identity that they've identified with even if it's five years 10 years 15 whatever that's suddenly in some sort of a crisis they don't know you know, the, the state of, of how long that might be, um, you know, continuing forward. So the, the advice that I'd give to, to people is, is control the controllables, right? So in the, it, compete with yourself on eating the best that you possibly can, uh, sleeping as, getting as good a sleep as you can, hydration, all those things that you can control uh, within your mindset and let the professionals do what they do. And if you find someone that, that you like, obviously they'll, it'll be a partnership between you two. So I think having an athlete stay competitive in mindset, at least throughout the entire process is a big thing that not only helps with their mental outlook, but, you know, I mean, we know that mentality a lot of times can transfer to physical performance and preparation. So I think that's one of the key things that I would say as well. Uh, unbelievable point. Uh, Rain's very true right now, obviously, with our whole world going through uh, the COVID-19 and, you know, many of our athletes losing their identity, uh, their opportunity to play, their potential at a future, everything. Um, so it, it, it's incredibly impactful for an athlete who uh, it, the, their ability to be known as an athlete, perform as an athlete and, and do everything else as an athlete is so woven into their, who they are that it's extremely difficult for them to sort of have any uh, a semblance of what's normal uh, when that's stripped from them. So unbelievable point there. Uh, Coach CJ, I'm going to call on you next. Yeah, well, it's great going last. Um, no, so at the end, all the guys that are healthy, um, don't let your first time uh, throwing a baseball be on a mound. Uh, buy into a four, six, eight-week throwing progression because you don't want – you want to limit the risk of injury as much as we can, um, especially when you do get injured. Don't let that be the first time you get on a throwing program. Uh, for all the guys that are injured – you got to communicate with the pitching coaches, strength coaches, doctors, PTs, because all of our days of playing are done. We're here to help you. The only way this gets through, um, and this is the fastest way to get back, 
is for all of us to be on the same page. Um, and again, trust the process. Listen to all these guys. These guys are unbelievable. Uh, pleasure being on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, trust the process again. That's going to uh, be pretty much the theme, I think, for everybody across the board here. Uh, Coach Nick, we'll finish off with you. Go ahead. Yeah, just to understand your body and, you know, know, you know, the difference between, like, you know, Dr. Andrew said, the difference between being sore and, you know, being hurt. You know, and there's type of guys that are bulldogs and the other type of guys that, you know, they stub their toe out for a week. So um, it's, you know, and any time that you're throwing, you know, average major league guys are probably averaging 30 starts a, a year. They probably throw their best four times, you know, and the other 26 times is, you know, you got to grind out and compete. So it's, you know, if, if you felt good all the time, it'd be easy, you know. So it's more of, you know, just, you know, have understand your body, I guess, you know, so. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, listen, everybody, this was a, a phenomenal topic. I think we uh, – hopefully we provided as much – information as possible to the community that's going to listen to it and people can really take some things away um you know obviously anybody listening uh we will also share uh everybody's social media um we'll also share any way that you can get in touch with them if should you have any other questions um there'll be links uh to their personal websites and all of that so once again thank you everybody that uh partook in this really appreciate the time and everybody stay safe, stay strong. Thank you.